Matt, it's Bob and Tony here in our Eastern Connecticut studio. How are you tonight, Matt? Hi, Matt. Hi, very good. Thanks for joining us, Matt. It was Thank a you. pleasure speaking with you about a month ago on Thursday Night Tailgate, and uh, now Matt has made the transition over to the TV side, and we appreciate his time. Just some background about Matt, Tony, uh, for our viewers out there. Mm -hmm. Again, a former All-American at Penn State, grew up in Pennsylvania, played 17 years in the NFL, six different teams between 1979 and 1995. Brother of another NFL kicker, Chris Barr, the family of Bars, and of course, Matt, 300 field goals, Tony, over 500 extra points, hit extra points at a 98% clip. And in 1983, he made 21 of 24 field goals, which led the league for an 88% field goal percentage. And again, we're honored to have Matt with us tonight. And uh, Matt, again, uh, thanks for joining us. We uh, like to talk to our guests always about their younger days. And I just read that your father is in the National Soccer Hall of Fame. I would think the early days of kicking soccer balls had a lot to do with your father, and uh, it was literally in your blood. Well, that's true. And my dad was a wonderful soccer player, maybe uh, one of the best the country's ever produced. He was on that famous 1950 team that beat England in the World Cup one nothing uh, down in Brazil. He had the assist on the goal. And when we were growing up, we went to many of his games, apparently. I never remember watching him play. We were where exactly where he wanted us to be. We were under the stands, throwing the ball, kicking the ball, doing things, being active. Uh, and... That was their big thing with us growing up. You know, my oldest brother was in the 72 Olympics he, uh, as a soccer player. Mm. Uh, he mm -hmm. was also drafted in baseball. And then wow. My parents always encouraged us to have the balance between athletics and academics. One is not good without the other. If we weren't doing good in school, we didn't get to play sports. Uh, but they just wanted us to play mostly because uh, we didn't have time to get in trouble after school if we were playing a sport. That's very true. Mm -hmm. And again, you've mentioned a few of the sports you were involved with, Matt. How about teams that you followed, maybe some of your early heroes as a kid? Well, that's, that's the funny thing. Uh, because of my dad and his uh, notoriety around the world, I got to meet a lot of neat players mm. uh, in all sports. Uh, uh, God, I'm trying to think of the old uh, Phillies and athletics pitchers, but for, for us, it was just shaking their hand, admiring them for being a great pitcher, a good second baseman, a terrific third baseman, uh, and not taking it any further than that. You can learn from is what their attitude was. I, I met Pele uh, in the locker room uh, playing a preseason, not a preseason game, a preliminary game when Santos was visiting the United States and Philadelphia was one of his stops. I happened to be on the team that was playing before him. So I met him and the rest of Santos' uh, soccer team in the in the locker room, and it was just neat shaking his hand. Yeah, um, talking Pele. And that's, when you grow up mm -hmm. around that, you look for the traits of the truly wonderful players. I think Pele is one of the true sportsmen of the game. I remember the first uh, athlete I ever heard speak was Ray Nitschke. As a, in high school, and he scared the hell out of me. It was unbelievable. <laughs> he, he, he goes, you can do anything you want. If you want to play both ways, you can play both ways. And I'm going, yes, sir. Okay. I'll play every sport. <laughs> and uh, I always felt it was important when I had the privilege to speak to kids to try to give a good message and an important message because you always kind of remember the first person you see speak in that in that situation and I go back to Pele. I saw him at a banquet years later. He was the featured guest, of course, and he spent the entire three hours signing autographs. Wow. Didn't get a bite to eat. Spoke hmm. a few words afterwards. But he never looked put out. He was always smiling and engaging with all the fans who came to get an autograph from him. Mm -hmm. And I said, boy, that's a great sportsman. And I, I think the same way of Arnold Palmer. Uh, I 
was with him actually uh, about a week and a half before he passed, mm-hmm. playing golf out at uh, La Trobe Country Club. And uh, he was there, and he was engaging. And he's one of those guys, like the true sportsman, they know where they came from, and they're very engaging to everyone around them all the time. And that's I admire that a lot about guys like that. Isn't that incredible, Tony, mm-hmm. when you think of Pele at the time, probably the most well-known sportsman internationally in the, in the world. world. And he uh, became the person mm-hmm. that he was, and especially after he... His soccer days were over. But, again, we're on the phone with former NFL kicker Matt Barr. Tony. Matt, good evening. It's such a pleasure to have you. And I uh, wanted to ask you about Penn State. Did you go there for soccer or football? And what was it like to be a football player under Joe Paterno? Well, most of the schools that recruited me, and this was because of uh, my two older brothers, My dad knew that soccer players kicking footballs was not a novelty with the Gogolaks, Mm -hmm. that that was kind of Mm -hmm. the future of uh, professional football kicking, if you will. But we never wanted to give up soccer to play football. So my oldest brother, Casey, he tried to play soccer and football in high school with a lot of conflict and wasn't able to do it. Same thing when he went to the Naval Academy. Three years later, my brother Chris through a lot of conflict and whatnot, I was able to play both at high school and both in college. And for me, it was just naturally following suit. You know, play a uh, Friday afternoon soccer game and a uh, Friday night football game in high school or a Friday night soccer game and a Saturday football game in college. The uh, Most of the schools that recruited me recruited me because of the groundbreaking that my brother Chris did. And I was originally going to the Naval Academy, but I had the option of, I think, UCLA, Brown, and Penn State. Uh, Things didn't work out uh, with Navy because they had changed the soccer coach, so I decided on Penn State. But soccer was my first kind of love. And every other week, Joe Paterno would basically call me into his office and say, it's about time we cut this crap out. you got to choose one. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, I'd always thank him, and I say, Coach, I, I really, uh, really appreciate you giving me the time. I'm surprised to put up with it this long because you know I was getting beat up in soccer games, and uh, it did occasionally affect my kicking the next day uh, with football. So, but I had fun in soccer. I got to bump into people, and knock them down. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But with kicking, it was unless you were making a tackle, which I like to do. It was more, uh, you know, a mental exercise. You're, you, physically, it's not very demanding. Uh, there's technique and everything else involved, obviously. But I like being a part of the game. I like being involved and take it even a step further. You know, if I was a soccer player and I played 90 minutes of a soccer game and then had the guy who didn't spend five seconds on the field come and decide whether I'm going to be a winner or loser at the end of the game. I probably would look at that player a little askance, and I understand why the football kicker gets so much grief um, in the football world because it's it's really a different part of the game. Now, everyone's a specialist. You have snappers, you have third-down specialists, you have rushing specialists, and uh, it's not a, a big of a stigma to be a kicker in the NFL any longer. So that's kind of the evolution. And Joe and I had lots of run-ins over soccer versus football. But, um, you know, the thing about Joe and the truly great coaches I've been around is they knew what your best was. They expected to see it in practice. And more importantly, they expected you to get better during the week. Mm -hmm. Uh, And if you couldn't perform in practice, they didn't know what to expect on Saturday or Sunday. So there was a good chance that you wouldn't be playing. And that's, the coaches I got to be around were guys like Chuck Knoll, Bill Walsh, uh, Bill Parcells, Belichick, uh, Marty Schottenheimer. These uh, all were all wonderful coaches, Sam Ortigliano. And they all had that same quality of, we know what your best is. We're going to put pressure on you in practice to succeed. 
And now we know what to expect when game time comes around. Uh, whenever I read a new coach coming in and they're a player's coach, I say, yeah, that's the team you want to bet against because <laughs> things will be fine when they win, but as soon as things go south, the coach has no- nothing to go back on. Wow. You want the coach who goes, get better, you think, you know, <laughs> yeah. uh, because you're always trying to prove something. You are trying to get better, and if you're not getting better, you're getting worse because you can't stay the same when you practice. And speaking of Chuck Knoll, your first year in the league, again, you played two years under Knoll, Matt. First year in the league, uh, Knoll, you win the Super Bowl, but here you are with a Hall of Fame coach, and we've talked to different guys about the difference between him and Bill Cowher, but a Hall of Fame coach like Knoll, you're playing with, I counted at least eight Hall of Famers during those two years. Did you know at this time, well, actually winning a Super Bowl, you would know that they're a special team, but how uh, infamous this crew really was? Um, no, I was just a dumb rookie. I didn't know. <laughs> uh, seriously. These, yeah. I went in there, and I knew they were three, time, three out of five years winning Super Bowls. And mm-hmm. I'm dressed next to Bradshaw, and Swan and Stoll were uh, cat, across the corner from me. I was in the corner of the locker room, uh, you know, Franco Harris down the way and looking across the locker room, there's Lambert, and Joe Green, and Jack Ham, and all these Hall of Fame players, and you knew they were great players, but I just felt, hey, you can win any time you want. And it's easy to win the Super Bowl. Yeah. yeah. The, I know my rookie year, uh, we won the Super Bowl, and we got the ring, and I'm going, oh, yeah, that's nice. I really only got excited when I saw myself on a bubblegum card. Here, this is great. <laughs> I used to flip cards as a kid, oh, put yeah. them in the spokes of my tires. and <laughs> uh, I said, That was really cool, being on a bubblegum card. Uh, and then after the 80s with the Browns, uh, losing all those championship games, mostly to the Broncos, I realized how hard it was to get into the Super Bowl, let alone win it. And that's why the year with the Giants was so magical. We were the underdogs against the two-time defending champion San Francisco and uh, Buffalo uh, as the big uh, favorite in that game. And it made me appreciate that Steeler team even more. You know, I live in Pittsburgh, and so I see all these guys all the time. Mm -hmm. Most of them, or many of them, stayed in the city. And uh, it's a very tight-knit crew, and I was proud to be a part of them. And I appreciate it more now than I did then. Again, we're on the phone with former NFL kicker Matt Barr. Tony. And, Matt, you know, you, I think, are the first football kicker I've I've, certainly I've ever spoken to, and I think Bob might correct me, but I think you're the first that we've had on this particular show. I tried for years to kick a football, and I could kick it long and far, but I could not get any arch on it whatsoever. And Are kickers gifted? Is that a gift, or is that something that people can improve upon? Did other players try oh, it? I, I think, did you kick straight on or soccer style? I tried it both ways and with equal result. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, it's very similar to golf. Mm. And in golf, you get into a lot of trouble when you're trying to lift the ball up. That's not how it works. When I'm coaching a kicker, if anything, uh, if I feel like they're struggling a little bit, I tell them to line drive it. Hit the middle of the ball. Try to hit the uh, the tee where the upright meet, meets the crossbar. Mm-hmm. Uh, hit a line drive there. And more often than not, it ends up being a pretty good kick because if you strike down through the ball, and follow through, hit the sweet spot, basically just barely under center of the ball. I mean, millimeter under center of the ball. The ball goes up naturally with the uh, arc of your leg, not because you're trying to lift it up uh, with your toe or anything else. Mm-hmm. And that's that's the biggest key, striking the ball. Uh, you'll, you'll be surprised. It's the same thing straight on. You're really hitting up through the center mass of the football. And uh, because I played soccer all my life, uh, hitting the football was just 
more trying to get the control of the ball rather than trying to blast it as hard as he could. How, how's that go? I uh, don't normally hit my sand wedge 170 yards, mm -hmm. but when I do, it's usually out of the garden side bunker. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. It does make sense. Yeah, blading it. Sorry. I, I'm not a good golfer. <laughs> And, and uh, you know, you know what's striking about your career, Matt, the entire 17 years always, for the most part, always played in cold climates. And, and, and this past weekend we saw two games where it was, in, it was incredibly cold. Uh, can you remember a certain game, you played so many of them, that, uh, that you still remember to this day where it just uh, the frigidness was beyond compare? Well, there were uh, two. One I was in the stands with, and the other was uh, obviously playing, but they were both in Cleveland. <laughs> and uh, my brother was playing with the Raiders against the Browns in a championship game. And the field was as hard as a rock. The balls were as hard as a rock, so they weren't traveling far. Mm -hmm. um, and when it gets that cold and you only have those, at least they only had space heaters, uh, you know, those kind of rocket engines things that threw flames out yeah um then the it got so cold you didn't want to take your helmet off because it was hard to get back on mm. uh it got cold and stiff and uh yeah. probably smaller because of the cold but it was so cold you had problem talking your face kind of got numb My. and all of a sudden you're going yeah. what <laughs> and that that was weird uh, because I can't wear extra insulation on my feet. I mm -hmm. just had a pair of socks on wow. under my uh, shoes. I really, I, I, I think I let a lot of lit a lot of shoelaces on fire and had to change them two or three times during the game because the feet go numb almost immediately uh, in cold weather like that. And as I said, the ball gets hard. Uh, because Cleveland was a <laughs> marginally grass field, it was uh, more packed ice or dirt. It was hit, it, like hitting off a of concrete, uh, so you had to adjust your steps to make sure you weren't slipping and whatnot. Uh, but yeah, it it it's a different game, uh, especially the quarterbacks trying to keep their hands warm, the receivers and the DBs. Uh, trying to get the ball because your extremities get numb pretty quick. And I'm always impressed uh, with everyone's ability and skill in bad weather like that. And you Matt, know, I think yesterday's game, Clay Matthews, uh, <laughs> having the awareness, this had nothing to do with the cold, but he, he knew he had stripped the ball. Mm -hmm. And he was one of maybe two people on the field other than the referees who knew that the ball was still in play. Yeah. Uh, and that turned to change the game. That it was, ended the game, if you will. It was a great play. Uh, it was such a heads-up play. It was. And, and, and uh, uh, more on that topic, Matt, about the ball itself. Say you're kicking a uh, zero-degree wind chill as opposed to, say, a 75-degree day in Miami. The ball itself. Uh, we've had kickers on the Thursday night show it, that have told us it's like kicking a rock. But uh, give us your experiences with that. Well, you, you lose distance okay. uh, primarily. Mm -hmm. uh, you, you lose a lot of distance, and uh, quite frankly, it hurts. <laughs> uh, yeah. yeah. Uh, I mean, I remember uh, just this World Series, Cleveland and Chicago, they had one cold day, and one of the analysts who was a pitcher said, it's, you're not throwing a baseball anymore. You feel like you're throwing a cue ball. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. You're not able to grip it quite right. Uh, it doesn't feel good in your hand. Uh, you don't have the same rotations, and that's basically what it is. You're losing uh, some significant difference uh, distance, and uh, it's it's hard, especially on the kickoffs. You're you're whacking it, and you're, oh god, this is going to hurt. <laughs> you have to hit it anyway. That's uh, some. Telling stuff, and of course, uh, watching those guys kick yesterday, uh, you got that oh, feeling. Your it's, heart goes out. It's different than the. Well, they, no, don't be. Hey, 
no one told them they wouldn't be kicking on bad fields or bad weather. <laughs> you knew the job was dangerous when you took it. I know, we shouldn't so, pity him, oh, right? I'm surprised that it's yeah. a game-winning field goal. I never thought that would happen. <laughs> and that's just, uh, that's silly. And I always get your job done. That's mm -hmm. why, yeah. you know, that's probably why I got hurt and why I'm involved in that. Because uh, I like making tackles. I like trying to show I was a mm -hmm. part of the team and uh, it gave me something to do. Uh, sometimes to my detriment. Yeah. I, you know, I got knocked silly once in a playoff game against Chicago because I tackled the guy badly. That's and uh, they thought I had broken my neck. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Uh, that was with the Giants. Uh, I just, uh, and that's why I got involved with the uh, Harvard Health Center. Yeah, we'll yeah. talk a little bit about that and, and get Matt talking about tackling, uh, recording a tackle in that uh, Super Bowl victory over Buffalo. And I should tell our viewers, again, Matt had the NFC Championship game record, kicking five field goals. That was back in 91 when they uh, all their points against the 49ers were from Matt Barr field goals, 15-13. Tony, you want to say something more about the New York days, I think? Yeah. That and, was the game. Yeah, that was the game that uh, Joe Montana got knocked out. Right. For, uh, mm -hmm. Good in, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it took a vicious hit. Uh, not illegal, just a really hard hit. Yeah. Uh, and it pretty much ended his career. Tough, tough. You know, Matt, and well, one thing I did want to come back and ask Matt, yeah. being a kicker on a professional football team, I mean, I go back to listening to Alex Karras when he first started to do stand-up comedy in the European kicker, I'm going to kick a touchdown. And everybody's like saying, you know, how did this guy get on the field? Is that an odd place to be from time to time, you know, as a kicker on a football team? Well, in those days, we, we were odd. We came from <laughs> completely different backgrounds. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, Gary Premium was a good friend, and the first game he ever kicked in was a pro game. Wow. Uh, wow. And, uh, yeah. They, hmm. And they didn't really tell him a whole lot. And as a matter of fact, a lot of there's a lot of stories of the the guys. I, I want to say it was Tony Frisch, uh, the German or Austrian, didn't speak a whole lot of English, and they taught him a whole lot of English in the locker room, which his wife used in the stands, and <laughs> he used when he was getting the ball from the official. That's uh, <laughs> to his teammates' amusement. And, you know, they were just trying to find guys who could put the ball through the upright. And, you know, you, you have to think of the natural evolution of why it went from straight-on kicking to soccer style. The straight-on kickers, they had a surface area of, you know, a couple couple square inches. It was the flat toe, uh, unless it was, um, who was it, George Blanda, or uh, not, Tom Dempsey. Oh, right, who yeah. had a half a foot, and, yeah. you know that was a big square mm -hmm. on his uh, on the front of his foot. So he was hit with a sledgehammer. Yeah. Uh, so it's a smaller surface area. You're hitting it on uh, the top of your foot, on the, the knuckles, if you will, uh, not on the toes. So you get a lot of surface area on the ball. The reason straight on kickers were more effective way back when was because the fields were so crappy. Mm -hmm. uh, they, straight on guys plant heel toe, and so if you got a muddy, uh, sloppy field, they have a better plant, and they have more of an opportunity to get through the ball. Now with the fields getting better, more turf, more uh, quality grass uh, through the hole, you, you don't have that problem. So when you're coming in from the side and planting on the kind of the corner of your heel, and then your foot flattening out. Um, you you do have good uh, traction, if you will. I I kicked good in a, on bad fields because I could make that adjustment. Mm -hmm. But you can see what happens to some of these guys if the field starts to get sloppy and uh, or very windy and uh, the conditions become a factor. That's uh, that that was the evolution. That's why soccer players eventually took over, and they just went and looked for soccer players. Now they're looking for. I'm sure the punters are getting the same business uh, because there are a lot of the Aussie rules football punters coming in, yeah. mm -hmm. and they've evolved the uh, the technique of punting, if you will, 
using their rugby skills, but I'm sure there's uh, the similar stories in the locker room. Not as much because I don't think I, I think they could handle their own in a locker room. Yeah. We just came from a different background, and so football was not other than playing sandlot. Most most of the guys from the U.S. played soccer uh, and just sandlot football, if you will, growing up. Interesting. Interesting. Telling about Matt's career, Tony, again, we talked about his first year in Pittsburgh, they mm -hmm. win the Super Bowl. His first year in New York, they win the Super Bowl. That's yeah. a good marketing tool, right? Matt, I mean, you can say, you <laughs> sign me. <laughs> With a lot of distance in between. <laughs> yeah. It, yeah, well, it was, uh, I was actually a uh, temp for the 49ers when they won their first Super Bowl. That's true. Mm. That's true. Uh, you lost. Yeah, Eddie DeBartolo promised me that if they won and... He, uh, I think he forgot. <laughs> oh, Matt, was there dear. a difference between the the Parcells that you played for in New York and the guy that would coach you a few later, a few years later in New England? Did he change at all, or was he still the same? No, not at he, all. Uh, yeah. He was the consummate football coach. Yeah, he just wanted to win the game. Yep. However, you had to win the game. You win the game. Uh, if you could convince him and he believed you that you could help him win one game, you'd be on the team. Mm -hmm. Because as a coach, his job was to win games, and I think that rubbed off a lot on Bill Belichick, uh, that that mentality of uh, they're, they're trying to get the job done. And I think he liked me mostly because I was one of the – one of the few kickers who didn't make any excuses. Mm -hmm. uh, I would come off the field saying, oh, it was a bad snap, a bad hold. Uh, the wind came up. He'd, I'd come off the field. He goes, what happened? I go, I messed. <laughs> <laughs> he didn't know what to say. He goes, well, make the next one. Okay. That's about <laughs> it, right? What gives you that? That's just mm -hmm. It's the uh, relationship of a coach and a kicker. Tony, we got a few more minutes left with Chris, uh, Matt. That's Chris Barr. I'm, I'm going to talk about Chris in a minute, but right. go ahead, Tony. I, I did want to ask Matt about the uh, Harvard football player health study. You know, Bob and I in this show have done a lot of crusading, if not crying, for older players and their welfare and uh, you know, we don't feel that uh, a lot of times or a great deal of the time older players in any sport are looked upon uh, well at all by their organizations. What are you running into and uh, what exactly are you doing with the Harvard study, Matt? Well, this is, it's, it's fun. I'm advising uh, with them. Harvard is doing a research uh, on football players' health, but it, it translates into everyone's health. If you will, if you feel like going to it, you go to footballplayershealth.harvard.edu mm -hmm. and click on the about, and you'll find a whole lot of information about what they are trying to do with it. Basically, they started with a preliminary study where uh, it got about 3,500 players who filled out the survey, and it's for the prevention, the diagnostics, and the treatment of very specific types of injuries and conditions that players uh, eventually get, like knee injuries or head injuries, uh, things of that nature. And what's unique about this study is it's Harvard, first off. They're not, they don't have an agenda. Whatever it shows, it shows. What makes this study different is that they're doing a – a combination of instead of just doing the study and the results, they're trying to find out what they can do to treat these things. So if you go to the about and you click on uh, knee injuries, the ACLs, mm -hmm. um, they're finding that a lot of people have knee injuries. You know, a lot of the players have that. And there's long-term conditions. Well, they're actually developing surgeries that can repair not – to help a torn ACL heal on its own. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. uh, they, so they're actually coming up with ways that the former player, which is every weekend athlete in the world who ends up with a knee injury, that now, hey, an ACL is not the uh, end of your life. Not only that, uh, we might be able to help repair it completely. 
you know, the, the reconstruction surgery. And this is just one area that they're working on. So we're trying to get more and more pro players because that's who the focus is on the surveys uh, to fill out the survey, but it's going to be good for everyone. Um, and with the concussions, I just saw a clip of the uh, Tom Brady's up in your neighborhood, right? He's yes, the yes. quarterback kid. Right. Uh, he took a shot against Buffalo uh, that knocked him loopy, and it was because um, – I don't know how many years ago, but he's looking at the guy coming forward at him, and he doesn't see the guy coming from the side mm. and it just tattoos him. So he's not ready for it. He has the initial head injury with the the helmet-to-helmet contact and then the additional injury of his head hitting the ground. Mm. How can you, you know, the the equipment – is evolving, and this is what Harvard is helping out, evolving the equipment to help prevent even those types of injuries. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's so exciting because they're actually doing things to help the player uh, now, to help the players who are playing now, and to help the play people who are coming into the game later because they love the game. They want to see the game to go on mm -hmm. and everything they can do is going to be useful for the players and hopefully a lot of people around the country. So check it out. It's, it's interesting. It, it does is, sound I, interesting. I found Thank it interesting you. and very rewarding. These yeah. people are brilliant. Especially, and Matt made the great point, Tony, no agenda. That's the well, thing. That's, that's yeah, the that's main critical. thing. And uh, th that's what we need to, to get results here. And I wanted to ask you before we let you go, Matt, about you and your brother, Chris. I mean, amazing to me how two guys could have such long careers, two brothers. Uh, when you guys, during the season, off-season, family get-togethers, did you talk shop constantly, Matt? What was the relationship as far as uh, did you, or, or else was there other oh, things? Oh, not a bit. Not a, there you go. <laughs> See? They're kickers. No. They're kickers. Like, uh, you know, it, it was so simple. What how to do? I made it. Okay, great. Yeah. What happened? I missed. You know. <laughs> no, we, and when we would play against each other, uh, you know, Pittsburgh and uh, Cincinnati when he was there, Pittsburgh and the Raiders uh, when he was there. Uh, when my parents would come to the games, people would ask, who, who do they root for? They go, both of us. They want us both to uh, kick well. They don't want to have to support us. They want us to keep the job. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. You know, so there was, no, there was no agenda there. It was just, hey, it's good work if you can get it. And, uh, so... We, he was the more natural kicker. Mm. Uh, he kicked the ball cleaner and could hit it a bit further. I was more mechanical. So if things went south for him, which it, it happens, uh, it was harder for him to get out of it. And for me, because I was more mechanical, when things went south for me, I could go back to something more basic. But that was about as far as it was. If we saw something that the other was doing, obviously we'd point it out uh, as soon as we could. I will tell uh, one dopey story if you're if you're interested. Sure. Oh, sure. We were playing the we were playing the Raiders uh, with the Browns, and it was right after Top Gun came out. And this is relevant because Clay Matthews Sr. was my teammate. Yeah. And the, the Raiders tried like a 65 or 70 yard field goal at the end of the half. Uh, and so we had a returner back behind the goalpost or by the goalpost in mm -hmm. case it came up short and we could get a run back. Well, of course, it came up short and our guys running back. That, that, you know from your other shows that when there's a turnover or an interception, it's usually payback time. Yes. Uh, the defenders get free shots on the offensive players or they mm -hmm. think, right. you know, that sort of thing, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So. Clay Matthews comes off afterwards and says, uh, hey, Matt, you got to thank me. I just saved your brother's life. <laughs> oh, what happened? <laughs> oh, well, I had missile lock on your, your on this guy. I realized it was your brother, and uh, I pulled off and hit the next guy in line. <laughs> <laughs> we watched the films, and Chris watched the film. Clay is running around the field with his arms out in flying formation. 
and you can see him get missile lock on my brother, and he's got a kill shot. My brother's not looking at him at oh, all. Wow, oh, my goodness. And at the last second, you see Clay tilt his wings up and veer by him and hit the, the next Raider who got taken off on a stretcher. Wow. Uh, and Chris Cinema, bottle of wine. I was just uh, going to say, yeah, it's going to be on your Christmas he list. He really did save the life. I could just hear Clay doing this because he was like that. The son is the same way, you know. Boop, 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 boop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they, uh, oh, what a tough player. And, and they, they are clones. It's, uh, what a story, what a story. Tony, do you have a final question for Matt? Yeah, and I, Matt, I get the impression that a pro kicker is an extremely nuanced guy. Did you have a favorite kick holder? Hmm. I, I like quarterbacks. Mm -hmm. I, I thought quarterbacks were the best holders because they had uh, receivers and DBs are taught to reach out for the ball, to snap at the ball and mm -hmm. get it as far away from them as possible. And that, to me, that was startling where the receiver snaps, uh, snaps his hand getting the ball, if you will. Quarterbacks uh, catch it with soft hands because they want to use it right away. They need it under control. Uh, so they put it down south. The other part of it is they got a great attitude. <laughs> they are, they're usually miffed that we're kicking a field goal because they wanted to score a touchdown. That's true. And second, they look back at you, just kick the darn ball. <laughs> I don't want to hear it. You know, and to me, that was very calming. Uh, when you have someone who has soft hands, has the right attitude, and uh, really good control. And if something does go wrong, uh, they're well equipped to deal with that type of broken play. So I, I always, uh, my best holders were guys like uh, Jeff Hostetler with the Giants, mm -hmm. yeah. Paul McDonald with the Browns, I, uh, Zolak uh, with the Patriots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very uh, so they, I, all things being equal, I'd rather have a quarterback. Uh, holding. Great stuff. Matt, our time is up, and we can't thank you enough for being generous We've with your time. We've learned so much. And, thank uh, you, Matt. We always uh, love having kickers, talking to kickers on any show we do, and uh, we, we thank you for your time. Please keep in touch. I'm sure we'll be talking on the other show again. Uh, our best to your family. Stay warm, and uh, thanks for coming on tonight. Thank you again. Thanks for having me. Just remember, old kickers never die. I just keep missing the point. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. We'll leave you with that. Take care, Matt. Good night. Good night, Matt. Night.